lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, on and on and on and on about these things, but I thought particularly that lovers of self uh, is, should be blatantly apparent to anyone and everyone. I mean, I really don't know anything that's promoted love of self as much as this. Yeah? Selfies. Just saying. Yeah, yeah, I'll eat it. Yeah, yeah, all right. Selfies, man. You know, it's like a, a mirror wherever you want, however you want, you know. And there are people, man, that post 10, 15 pictures of themselves a day. I mean, I'm not hating, I'm just saying, you know. Yeah, all right. But brothers, this is my question about loving of yourself, you know. Uh, people say, well, you know, you got to take time for yourself. you you, you got to, what do you call it, self-care, self-heal, self-whatever. You know, think about that. All right. I'm not necessarily against those things. I'm not saying that those things are bad. What I am saying is that how can you love another when you're in the middle of loving yourself? Well, I'm going to take a day for myself. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's the mentality. You go do something. I don't know. Whatever, man. Treat yourself, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. And in the midst of that day, an opportunity arises that the well-being of another person in front of you is in need. But today, it's about you. You see what I'm saying? I know a group of people who, uh, I don't know, they, they say they work for God. They say they work ministry. And, uh, you know, but... Uh, they have no qualms whatsoever about crushing their meeting to go on vacation, you know, or because maybe it's a holiday, you know, or just because they need to spend time with their family, you know what I mean? And let's remember that the meeting only really lasts about an hour, hour and a half out of the day, you know, okay. And uh, brothers, I'm just like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my mind around that, you know, because uh, when God is your focus, and God is your everything, which it needs to be, brothers, you know, uh, how can you put anything else before that? Jesus said, any person who loves mom and dad, wife and child, brother, sister, any other person on this planet more than me is not worthy of me. Yeah, yeah. And brothers, that includes yourself. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, all right. And so that, you know, I, I, I'm just like, man, I can't do that. I, I, dude, I couldn't do that. Do you understand? Yeah. My wife and I have been seven years without a vacation, man. You know? Yeah. Not, leastwise, not some, like a real vacation. You know, you go for a long time or what, at least a week, I guess. You know, it says that vacation length, a week, two weeks for some people. Yeah. There has been two times in the last seven years that we loaded up. We went to Gatlinburg once. We spent a couple days there in Gatlinburg. And uh, uh, I think it was, bef was before the pandemic. We went to West Virginia, wasn't it? To that park. Yeah, we went to a park in West Virginia and stayed a couple days. You know, but we can't go on vacation like that. You know, because she does the, her ministry shopping on Thursdays. You know, she gets the bananas and she gets all the stuff for the sack lunches, you know. And I do my shopping on Saturdays. You know, I get the gravy and the biscuits, whatever we might need on that day. And Saturday is spent in preparation for Sunday, you know. Of course, Sunday morning we get up, we make the meal, we come down, you know. And then we go home and clean up. <laughs> to give my wife credit, she does the dishes. You know, all right. <laughs> I load and unload. I cook most everything, but she does the dishes. And after that, man, I'm pretty tired, you know, yeah, and uh, I, I, I couldn't think of skipping that for nothing, guys. I've talked to other people who work ministry, you know, and uh, they said, you know, man, I've gotten up before and not really felt like going at all, man, you know, but, but I win anyway. Like, like I was supposed to give them some credit or some praise or something, you know, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, man, I have never ever gotten up on Sunday morning at 4 o'clock and never, ever felt like not going. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I, I'm not saying I'm better or they're worse. I'm just saying there's a difference. Yeah. I don't know exactly what that difference is, but there's a difference. Brothers, we have to love others the way that we love ourselves. The question is, how do you love yourself? Yeah. Let's get to some scriptures here. We've heard a couple of these before, brothers, but we're going to hear them again so that we can have it in our minds. Yes, okay. 
Matthew 22, 35 through 40. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked Jesus a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. All these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, last week in this reconciliation, we covered how it was that these two commandments, how the whole law of God, all 613 commandments hang on these two commandments. Yes. Because there are two kinds of commandments. There are the do's and there are the don'ts. Yes. Most of the do's are because you did what you were not supposed to. This is the reason why you had to do. If we didn't do what we weren't supposed to do, then we wouldn't have to do what God said to do. Do you see what I'm saying? How they work? That's called faith. Yeah. Because the works of the law, sacrificing animals, passing judgment, getting revenge, yes, these kinds of things, yes, yes, all right. Now, the other half of the commandments were the don'ts. And we understand that the don'ts governs this love that we have for God and our neighbors. Don't have any other gods before me. Don't bow down to graven images and worship them. Don't profane my name. Do you see how that works? Don't do these things. Because if you do these things, then you don't love me. Yeah, okay. Don't steal. Who are we going to steal from? Each other? Our neighbor? Don't lie. Well, who are we going to lie to? Each other? Our neighbor? Don't covet thy neighbor's goods nor thy neighbor's wife. Well, again, the command governing our relationship with our neighbors. This is the reason why the whole law hangs on these two, brothers. This is the reason why it's super important to know what love is. What love really is. Not what you think love is. Not what your neighbor thinks love is. Not what your relative thinks love is. But what God says love is. Yeah. Alright. Because, brothers, if we can know what love is, then we can love God, can't we? That's all I wanted to do, brothers. After 12 years of slipping and tripping, fumbling in the dark, man, realizing that I was not going to be able to do anything on my own, I realized that I, I believed that I could love God. And that I could love those people around me. I believed I could do that. I just didn't know how. I thought I knew how, but I didn't know how. Yeah, alright. Now... Matthew chapter 5 verses 43 through 48. We've had this before too. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, but hate thy enemy. I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you only, what reward have you? Do not even the sinners do the same. And if you salute your family only, what do you more than others? Do not even the sinners do the same. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Ooh, oh, Mr. Preacher, man, I can't be perfect. Can't nobody be perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. Right? Right? Wrong. Wrong. You think Jesus is going to command you to do something that's impossible for you? Brothers, don't you know we're going to be punished for not doing what we're supposed to do? Do you think God is sitting up there twisting like that? Telling you that you got to do something that you can't do and then going to punish you for not doing it? Would you do your kids that way? Isn't God a much better daddy than you? Okay, brothers. Accountability, man. Accountability. How many times in your life have you told the truth? As 
possible, ain't it? If you can tell the truth one time, then you can tell the truth every time, can't you? How many times have you seen something that you liked or wanted and didn't steal it? If you can do it one time, then you can do it every time. It's not impossible, folks. If you say it's impossible, then what you say is it's impossible to love God. Because 1 John chapter 5 verses 1 through 4 tells us the way to love God is to keep His commandments. And to love our neighbor as ourself. That these two are one. Alright, folks. It's not impossible. And listen. I didn't say this. Now, brothers, I'm going to forewarn you now. Anyone, anyone that you hear says opposite of this is in opposition to God. Do we understand? Brothers, because this is important. We need to know who is for God and who is against God. If you're going to be for God, then you need to be able to recognize one who opposes God. Yeah? Because, brothers, you know, uh, the devil probably knows these scriptures better than me. I mean, I've only been at this book 25 years, you know what I'm saying? But I'm guessing he probably knows them better than me. And he's always going to give you a kernel of truth in his life. But nobody wants to be accountable. I understand that, man. Why? It's not that I don't want to be accountable. Really, it's just that I don't want to be wrong. If I admit that I want to be right, and then I do wrong, I don't want to be wrong. Especially after I've admitted that I want to be right. Oh, man, that's the worst thing. Because now people point your finger at you. Call you a hypocrite. I'm just saying, all right. Yeah, that's the worst. Well, is this possible? How much you going to love God? How much? Some of your mind? Some of your heart? Some of your strength? Or all of it? Do you see how if you love Him or all these things, then these things are possible? Yeah! Oh yeah! Alright. Jesus said, to bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Yeah? Yeah. To love even our enemies. I struggled with that for a long time. You know? I sure did. And one of the ways I found not to struggle as hard with that was to stop looking at people as my enemy. Even when they were in opposition to me. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. The next thing I had to do was quit standing for anything that God stands against. Because then they were not my enemy, but God's enemy. Do you see how that works? If I stand for what God stands for because this is what God tells me to do, and somebody opposes me, then they don't oppose me, they oppose the one that I follow. Because that's the reason why I stand for it. Do you see what I'm saying? That detaches you personally from the situation, does. Now the hard part is living your life like that. Not giving people room, you see what I'm saying, to oppose you in something. Some behavior, some word that you say, or some other malicious thing that you might have done, even on accident. That's going to take time, brothers. Yeah, it's going to take time. But notice how this was the perfection. He said that God sent his reign on the just and the unjust alike. Now, those of you who don't know, in Leviticus 26, we understand that reign was a blessing for obedience. Yeah. For those people who kept God's commandments, God said, I will send the rain in due time. So that their crops would grow, their animals would flourish, because without the rain, we don't have these things. You see how that works? Yeah. Alright, well, Jesus said that even the unjust was getting the benefit of the rain. Meaning, those people who didn't do what God said were still getting the benefit of rain. Now, Romans tells us that when we commit sin, we make ourselves God's enemy. That there is enmity between He and us. Yes, okay. So then, 
if those people who were unjust committing sin are still receiving the rain, you have to ask yourself, why? Why are they receiving the rain? Because God loves them. Last week we learned that Christ died for us while we were yet in sin. While we were kicking it out there, not caring about God, not thinking about God, not looking His way, brothers. This was when He loved us. While we were doing everybody else wrong and dirty, this was when He loved us. While we were His enemies. Loving even our enemies is being perfect like God does. Don't get that perfection twisted. Yeah? Don't let these people out here define this perfection for you, brothers. Do you understand? This is where it comes from. Godly counsel. That's what godly counsel is, brothers. That's counsel that comes from the scriptures. Get it all time, don't you know? Does it work? Just saying. Counsel that comes from the scriptures. Now they have all kinds of, you know, psychotherapies and yeah, you know, I'm just yeah, I've been through the rigmarole, man, yeah, treatment facilities, and medications and all that jazz, yeah, yeah. And guess what? It never worked out for me. Years and years and years and years and it never worked out for me. But there was one thing that did work for me, brothers. And that was Godly Counsel. When I committed all my mind, all my heart, and all my mind to it. Yeah. Alright. So therein lay the perfection, brothers. Loving even our enemies. Now, this is what I gotta tell you, brothers. If your dedication to God, if your love is so strong that you could love even that person who opposes you, how hard is it gonna be to love those people who don't oppose you? How hard is it going to be to love the one that loves you? Well, that should be a breeze, shouldn't it? I mean, if my love is so strong, I can love that person stabbing me in the back. Why would I have any problems loving the one that's loving me? Oh, man, but that makes so much sense. Perfection. Perfection. Brothers, the love of God will perfect you. Somebody just needs to get in the book of John. John 1, John 2, John 3. Yeah. Read them books, but those are not very long. Okay, sure. Yeah. But they're full of this love and this perfection, man. Yeah. Alright. So then. Yeah. Alright. I'm gonna love you, my enemy, man. Yeah. I'm not I'm not there yet, guys. Yeah. Don't, don't take it like I am. I still have uh, triggers. Okay. Uh, I've only been at this now for uh, since 2012. I mean, you know, for real, 2012, man. Yeah, okay. I mean, that's like 11 years now. 11 years, it seems like a while, but of those 11, I've only been sober then. Yeah, okay. No, wait. This makes 10, but okay. No, man. Yeah, then. All right. I really don't keep track of it like that, brothers, because it's not something that I've done. You see what I'm saying? It's not something I celebrate because of what I've done. It's something that Jesus done within me. Yeah, okay. But anyway, so, you know, I'm not like, I'm not all the way there yet, man. I'm not where I need to be, and I know this, yeah? But I don't give up. And I don't reject the truth. Oh, well, it's impossible, man. Yeah, I can't do it anyway, man. Nobody can do that. You know, it's okay. It's all good. Because when you do that, brothers, what you're doing is you're opening up a back door to your accountability. Don't you understand? It is godly sorrow that produces true change within you. And when you excuse yourself, when you open up a back door for yourself, brothers, then what you're doing is you're letting go of that godly sorrow, that sorrow that's going to change you. Oh, yeah. Give yourself, man. Yeah. I really want somebody to show me where it says that in there. I, you know, because in all my readings, brothers, it's always been his God who forgives us for Jesus Christ's sake. Alright. Yeah. 
But you cannot allow the ways of this world to shape your perception, your understandings, or your desires. You cannot. And you can't trust some loud mouth fool like me. Don't you know this? It's got to be up to you. You to find this out. Don't get you, boys. Oh, Joe Osteen's a good preacher. Man, he's got millions of dollars. He's blessed. I say that name because I'm sure that's someone most of you have probably heard of. Yeah, all right. But you don't trust your salvation, brothers. Hopefully it's Jesus Christ. All right. You know, when I was ripping and robbing, man, and hustling, I didn't put my hustle into no one else's hands. You understand? Yeah. yeah. No one else's hands. All right. Why would I start now? Oh, man, no mistake, brothers. I still a hustler. Oh, yeah. Always. It's just that now I don't hustle for myself. And now I hustle for Christ, brothers. Do you understand? To increase the kingdom. Alright. Alright, brothers. I ain't lost nothing. Trust me. Brothers, you're going to have to get in there and find this out, man. Alright. So, I love you and our enemies. Man. So, you know, uh, that might be a good place to start. Let's, let's read down here. Matthew 5, 23 through 24. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remember that thy brother has something against thee, leave there thy gift at the altar and go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Ooh, man. You know, I, I really... It, that was a long time coming for me in understanding this, you know, because I was under the impression that first I had to come to God, you know, yeah. And and in respect, brothers, this is true. You must come to God, yeah. Which means you come ready and willing to accept what He says and to do what He says. Because remember, James chapter four, it's not enough to just be a hearer of the word. No, no, no. If you're only a hearer of the word, you'll forget. Yeah. But if you're a doer of the word, then you'll remember it. And that man will be blessed in his deed. So that when I come to God, I come with the full expectation to accept what he says, to believe it, and to do it. Yeah. You come to the altar to offer that gift. I then remember that someone out there has something against you. Leave your gift. And go. And be reconciled to this person. Then come off of that gift. Well, that's my question to you is, what is your gift? What is your gift? Is it your ties? Money? Is that your gift? I mean, you know, because nowadays that's pretty much what everybody gives. You know, right? I mean, ties, money, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, okay. But it's just nothing. In this world that you can give to God that doesn't already belong to Him. Don't you know? I mean, the ink and the paper that that money is made from comes from the trees and other elements out there, man. It all belongs to God. How are you going to give Him something that belongs to Him as a gift? That's the reason why He says, Where is the house that you built for me? Wood, stone, all these things have my hand made. I have built this house. No. The house that we built for God is right here, brothers. Right here. So, what is it that we're going to give to God at the altar? Well, this is only one thing we got to give. Only one. Love. Love. That's it. That's all you got. I mean, brothers, your body ain't even yours. God made that. He formed it while you were in your mother's womb. Oh, no, oh, man, it was a cellular division, and I was an embryo, and it grew, man. No, it was God. In your mother's womb. Maybe you to pay who you are and what you are. Here and now. All right. It belongs to God. 
belongs to him. Hold it, Lord. Jesus Christ died for your flesh. He paid for it like a ransom, brothers, in blood. You are not your own. So, all we got to give at the altar, brother, is our love, our devotion, our worship, our faith. And in truth, brothers, faith is not yours either. Faith, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, is a gift from the Holy Spirit. You understand? A measure of faith has been given to all mankind through the gift of Jesus Christ. Everybody. This is the reason why no one will have an excuse at the great white throne judgment. Now what we do with that faith is going to be up to us, brothers, but the increase of that faith is going to come from God. Why? Well, why do we believe? Why do we believe? I tell you why I believe. Because God kept His word to me. That's why I believe. That's why my faith is increased. God said it. If you, I will. I said, okay, God. I did. I did. He did. Faith is increased. It's love, friends. It's only love. And so that when we come to God to give Him all of our mind, all of our hearts, all of our might, yes, and we remember that somebody else has something against us. We got to kick rocks and get to that person, man, and try to make it right. Why? Why do we need to try to make it right? Maybe they wronged you. Yeah, maybe they were in the wrong. I'm just saying, man, they're supposed to be apologized to me. Is that what it's about? Is this reconciliation about he said, she said? Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, meaning he does you wrong, yeah, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word that may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, then let him be unto thee as a heathen and a sinner. Hmm. Man, guys, those of you, man, that's got to do this, make amends, you know, yeah, as a process of your uh, 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 program, you know, you might pay special close attention to this because if you notice, that was a process. Did you notice that process? First, we go to that person. Yeah. And we try to work it out with them, between them and us. We don't blast it on Facebook. We don't tell all of our friends and their mamas and everybody else. No, we don't do those things. We go to them and them alone. Because, brothers, if you blast it like that all over the place, what's going to happen? You're going to wound their pride. Which is going to what? Inhibit the chances of this reconciliation, brothers, because this reconciliation is more important than you, your life, and anything else that you hold dear. How about that? Oh, we're going to learn why that is. Trust me. So we go to that person, man. We go to that person, not necessarily to make it right. As in, we did something wrong to them and we got to make it right. Or as in, they did something wrong to us and they need to make it right. We're going to tell them, hey man, you know, you did this and you need to make it right. No. No, 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 friends. It's not about he said, she said. It's not about who wronged who. It's got nothing to do with it. This is what you're going to have to drive out of your mind. If you're going to be able to do this, it's going to be, that has to be all the way out. Because there is another reason why we must do this. Now obviously if we have wronged someone, yeah, then we go to that person out of love. Yeah, because perhaps you want to continue having a relationship.
relationship with them. Remember, reconciliation. First, it takes a mediator. Someone to mediate between you and them. Yeah. Then it's going to take an atonement. Something was done. Something has to be done to make up for that thing that was done. Then there's going to be terms. You can never do that again. Furthermore, I'm going to need you to do this, this, and this. Terms. And if you keep the terms of the relationship with us, everything goes smoothly. And if you fall away from the terms of the relationship, then the relationship falls apart. Yeah. Alright. Why is this relationship so important? Why is this relationship so important, boys? Matthew chapter 5, verses 25 through 26. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him. Lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Really I say unto you, thou shalt not come out by any means till thou hast paid the other most farther. Which is money, penny, whatever it is that's owed. Until you pay the last cent of whatever is owed. You're not going to get out. So, with this in mind, we go to that person. You know, whether they wronged us or whether we wronged them, it really don't matter. We go to that person on the basis of having a relationship. On the basis of that the possibility for the relationship exists. Do you see what I'm saying? That they're not holding a grudge against you in their minds or their hearts. If you can accomplish at least that much, brothers, then you have done well. Then you have done well. <clears throat> so then, if that doesn't work out, you're going and talking to them by yourself. You said to take a couple more. So that whatever is being said and done can be witnessed. Now, brothers, that, I mean, what? That's starting to sound kind of like a courtroom hearing, isn't it? Witnesses? Now I need witnesses? What do I need witnesses for? It don't even matter. If he's not going to be my friend, that's fine. I don't even care. What do I need witnesses for? Well, remember, unless the adversary hand the over to the judge. But as there is going to be a courtroom hearing, make no mistake. Yeah. There will be a judge. Oh yeah. So, we go with a couple more people. What kind of people do we take? Do we take allies? People who are on our side? Is that the kind of people we're going to take? We're going to go gang up on this individual and show him how wrong he is? That ain't going to solve nothing, does it? Are you going to make him want to have a relationship with you? Not at all. That's just going to make it worse, don't you think? What if somebody did you that way? What if there was something done that you didn't think you did? Or somebody came to you and told you that you did. And you're like, oh man, I didn't do that. And that guy comes back with two more people telling you, yeah, you're wrong. Now what are you going to do? Well, you're going to blow up. Go get some. That's what you're going to do. You're going to feel better. No, brothers. It's not about who's right, who's wrong, who did what to who. It's got nothing to do with it. Remember, we got to love even our enemies. You see what I'm saying? Even if that guy was in the wrong. Let's just say, for example, that it mattered, that he was in the wrong. Yeah. We have to love even our enemies. Which means... The relationship has to exist even without enemy. Now, how is that going to happen? All right. Now, if you take a couple more people who are like-minded, right? Not people who are your allies or who take your side of the situation, man. But people who are allies. People who understand the importance of reconciliation, of making amends. People who understand that there is going to be a courtroom and that there will be a judge someday. This is what you're trying to impress upon this person. Not that you're a good person. Not that he's wrong. But that you need to have this relationship or that the possibility for this relationship needs to exist because there has to be love between you 
Because if there is no love between you, what is that called? What are you knows and I know you do. It's called hate. That's what hate is, guys. The absence of love. Any man that says he knows God and has hate in his heart for another brother does not love God. He is a liar. The truth is not in him. Do you see what I'm saying? So love has to exist. This is the reason why he says, even after you take a few more people and he refuses, and then you take it before the church and he still refuses, well, let him live on as an unbeliever. Why? Well, I believe in Jesus. Man, I'm not an unbeliever because I won't reconcile this guy. Isn't he though? Isn't he though? Who's telling us to do this? Who's telling us to reconcile? No matter what, agree with that adversary quickly, but not in the way with him. Don't let him get away from you. Your adversary, the one who opposes you, agree with him quickly. Does not matter who's right or wrong? It's simple, brothers. It's simple. I'm going to tell you what. I'm sure every one of you know that we're going to be judged. Yeah, all right. And what we're going to be judged by, brothers, are the words of this book. Yeah, that's what we're going to be judged by. Yeah, okay. And uh, you and that person are going to be standing before Christ. Now, let's say that today this person you have a problem with, he, he don't know Christ. He don't even love Christ, man. Yeah. You don't have no problem then, do you? He's not even going to make it, is he? But don't you know that the possibility that this man can change exists? Yeah. Furthermore, furthermore, what is it Christ is going to be judging us on? Is he going to judge us on who did what to who? Or is he going to be judging us on why didn't you do what I said? I told you to agree with your adversary. I told you that if at the altar you remember that someone had something against you to leave your gift and go and be reconciled. I told you that if somebody had something against you to go to that person and to try to work it out with you. So that there would be love between you. That's what he's going to judge us on, brothers. That's the words of this book, isn't it not? He's not going to judge you on who was right and who was wrong. Who hurt whose feelings? No, oh, man. That ain't got nothing to do with it. Love overcomes all things, brothers. Do you understand? All things. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it's about. All things. So, the purpose of the reconciliation, brothers, is so that the chance for love can exist and be reciprocated. Do you see what I'm saying? Because, brothers, if you got a grudge in your heart against somebody, what are you less likely to do? Love that person. Now, you might be able to take the fault somewhere, maybe an institution or some other such thing where you know you have to at least pretend like you're friends or that you are social at the very least. Yeah. But what's in your heart? Jesus said, Now everybody who says, Lord, Lord, church of the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. Yeah. But it's just because you go through the motions, don't mean you're right. It's not always what we do that matters, brothers, but why we do what we do that matters most. The love has to exist, brothers. It has to be there. It has to be genuine. It has to be real. God sees the secret places, man. Those places that we keep hidden from every other person around us. Do you understand? The places in our mind. And the places in our hearts, brothers. These places that no one else can see. There might be people out there who take your word for it. Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah, but only God can see these places. Real knows real, but Yeah, every day, all the time, never fails. So, this reconciliation, this making amends, if that's the case, yeah, maybe that is the case. Maybe it was something that you did to this individual. Then you need to make amends. What kind of amend are you going to make? Are you going to set a limitation on what you do? To make amends. 
would you? How far would you go? Who are you doing it for? You doing it for them? Or are you doing it for Christ? How far are you going to go for Christ? Christ went to his death for us. To do what? To make amends for us. Is that what he did? Is that what his sacrifice is? That makes atonement for our sin? Amends? Brothers, you know, this is one of those things that everybody says is impossible. Yeah. That it's impossible. It can't be done. Can't nobody do that. And it's impossible. Only Jesus can do that, right? Yeah. This is one of those things. Loving our enemies. Turning the other cheek. Give it to any man that asketh of you. Yeah. Reconciling with those people who have wronged you. Yeah. These are part of those things that are impossible to everyone else. Brothers, the only reason it's going to be impossible to you is because you don't want to do it. How many times have you done the impossible? How many times have you done the impossible, man? How many times have you gotten up broken, busted, and scored by the end of the day? Impossible. No job. Nobody to just do you anything. How many times? Brothers, you can do the impossible when you want to do it. That's what we've always done, brothers. We've always done what we wanted to do. That's what we've done. And we've always lived by what we believe. That's what we've lived by. What we believed was right, we did. And what we believed was wrong, we didn't do. Unless it benefited our pocket. That's what we live by. Now, brothers, I'm telling you now, now we got to live by what God says is right and what God says is wrong. And we don't make no compromise for that. Ever. No matter what benefit it might seem like we're going to gain in this world, brothers. And we want to do this because that's what we'll do it. There's just nothing more there's nothing that I want more than coming down here and seeing you every Sunday. Nothing. Nothing. Why do I come? How is it possible? How is it possible to come down here seven years, brothers, without missing a meeting? How is it possible to come down here seven years and not have what it is that we needed? How possible is that? Because I wanted to, brothers. All things are possible with God. He's God who provides. He's God that gives my flesh the strength to get up and come. Do you understand? Yeah. Why? Because I want to. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Is Christ going to be in you or not? That's going to be up to you, brothers. Yeah. That's going to be up to you and your acceptance of the truth. Not your rejection of the truth. Well, I know God says that, man, but that's not what He really means. Yeah. No, brothers, you're not going to receive it then. You're not going to get nothing then. Trust me, I played that game for years and years and years, brothers. Yeah. Listen. Matthew chapter 7, verses 12 through 14. Therefore... All things whatsoever that you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter ye in through the hard gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereby. Because hard is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. Few there be that find it. Yeah. Treat others the way that you want them to treat you, right? That's the golden rule, is it not? Now, I know that in life we end up finding ourselves treating others the way that they have treated us. That's the way we harden ourselves. Yeah, it's where I harden myself. Okay, yeah. Brothers, no. We treat other people the way that we want to be treated. 
Now my question to you, as one who loves God, as one who keeps God's commandments because you love God, as one who does not do the things against his neighbor that God says not to do, how would you want your neighbor to treat you? The same way. So how are we going to treat our neighbors? The same way. Listen, brothers. Don't get it twisted. Loving someone and liking someone are two different things. Do you understand? Jesus loved everybody. But he didn't go hang out with everybody, did he? Did he? I mean, he went to those people. He ministered to them. He preached to them. He healed them. But did he go hang out to be one of them? There's a difference, brothers. There's a difference. Don't get it twisted. Yeah. You love someone, you do what God says. To and for that someone. Whatever God says, that's why you're doing it. Because of what God says. And this is how you love your neighbor as yourself. Because you love yourself. You want to be saved. This is why you do it. Because you love yourself. Alright. Now, he said, Hard was the gate. And narrow was the path that leadeth unto salvation. Yeah. He said, but wide was the avenue that leadeth unto destruction. He said, there would be many on this wide path, but only a few, only a few would even find the narrow path. Why is that, brother? Why do you think that is? I mean, you know, the truth is right here. That's where I got it. And anyone else in the last 2,000 years, this is where they've gotten it. So why is it so hard? Why would there only be a few? You know, when I was in high school, uh, I remember one of the statistics that I heard often was that there, at two thirds of the world, the whole world, uh, uh, claimed that Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that, you know, the other third, well, obviously they didn't claim Jesus Christ. Now, on the surface, it seems like, well, okay, that puts one third on the wide avenue that leads to destruction because they don't have Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that puts the two-thirds on the narrow path leading to salvation because they claim Jesus Christ. Now, wait a minute. That's kind of contrary to what Jesus said, isn't it? Two-thirds is the majority. And he said only a few would be on the narrow path. Somebody's lying, ain't they? Yeah. Now, how are we going to distinguish who is from who isn't? They're both saying they are. They're both claiming Jesus. They're both going to church and clapping their hands, man, saying hallelujah, amen, putting the money in the plate, man, maybe even volunteering at the soup kitchen every now and then. Who are we going to determine who is from who ain't? Something to think about, folks. Yeah. Something to think about. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. I'm going to reveal that here at the end. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. Ooh. Mm. Reconciliation is going to start where, brothers? A forgiveness absolutely has to start with